I'm Anne Rieselbach, the Architecture League's Program Director, and I'd like to welcome you to the opening program of the 2021-22 FF Distance Edition Series, which today is hosted by the Boston and Los Angeles-based firm Stoss. As some of you know, last year we reinvented the League's long-running, in-person, studio-based, members-only, First Friday receptions, tours, and project reviews as FF Distance Edition, featuring virtual visits to design studios across North America. Like First Fridays, these programs provide the opportunity to get a sense of the studio culture, to see where and how firms are working, and often, as you will tonight, to hear from a number of staff members, in addition to seeing and sometimes even touring recent projects or work in progress. If you want to catch up on past programs, you can find videos of the 2020-21 season on the League's website. This year's events feature design practices that are redefining the contemporary public landscape by responding to social and environmental concerns and exploring the intersections of architecture, technology, and ecology. Upcoming programs this fall and early winter include visits to Ants of the Prairie in Buffalo, Brooklyn-based W Architecture and Landscape Architecture, and the San Francisco firm Future Forms. Either later this fall or next spring, given the overarching theme of the 2021 series, we hope to add a few on the ground site visits to some of these firms projects. Today's program will be introduced and moderated by Mimi Zeiger, a Los Angeles based critic and curator. She has curated or co-curated numerous significant exhibitions, including the US Pavilion for the 2018 Venice Architecture Biennale, and the 2020-2021, like current, um, you can see it now, Exhibit Columbus with co-curator Iker Gill. Mimi has taught on both coasts and currently is teaching at SciArc. She's written for publications including the New York Times, the LA Times, Architectural Review, Metropolis, Architect, and Design, and particularly Jane Germain for this project. She was the 2015 recipient of the Bradford Williams Medal for Excellence in Writing about Landscape Architecture. Following the presentation and Mimi's conversation with Chris and other members of the Stoss team, the discussion will be open to all attendees, at which point we hope you will turn your cameras back on. You should keep them off along with your microphones during the presentation. And at that point, you may wanna put your screen back on a gridded view from the speaker view it should be on now. You'll be able to pose your questions in the chat section and when possible, and if you feel comfortable doing so, we invite you to ask them in person on the grid. You can raise your hand um, or indicate to us in the chat section that you'd like to do that. Before handing the mic or whatever we call it in Zoom over to Mimi, a few thanks are due. This program is supported in part by the New York State Council of the Arts with the support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature, as well as by the members of the Architectural League who make all of our programs and events possible. Please visit our website, archleap.org, for further information about membership and the League's upcoming and past programs. We have a deep archive of videos and texts. Finally, towards the end of the program, information will be posted in the chat section for those of you seeking CEUs for how to sign up for those. And with that, I turn the program over to Mimi. Great. Uh, thank you, Anne. Thanks to the League. It's really great to join you here on Zoom. Um, and you know, Zoom makes it possible for me to be able to join you uh, from Los Angeles, uh, which is where I'm uh, calling in from today. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Chris Reed, founding director of STOS and professor of landscape architecture at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. He is also the 2012 recipient of the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in Landscape Architecture. And this year's uh, Stoss's project, Brickline Greenway, received special recognition for community empowerment through a lens of diversity from the Boston Society of Landscape Architects. And in 2020, the same project was honored with a Progressive Architecture Award. So about a year and a half ago, um, which is a very long year and a half ago for most of us, I pressed send and emailed Chris an essay intended for his book, uh, Mise en Scene, which the uh, lives and afterlives of urban uh, landscapes soon to be published by Oro Editions and edited by Chris and featuring photographs by Mike Bellamy. And I think he's gonna talk about that tonight a little bit. Um, I had entitled my piece On Edge. 
It was June 2020, just a month after the murders of George Floyd and Verona, Bar Verona Taylor um, and the civic uprisings against police violence and everything felt edgy, a cocktail of anxiety and rage. The streets were both full of protests and empty under pandemic restrictions here in LA. And when Mayor Eric Garcetti issued a 9 p.m. curfew to try to control looting, the edges between urban and wild began to fray. One night, a pack of coyotes howled as they patrolled my Pasadena street. And in the still of the night, it seemed like nature had taken over. I, I share the story because Chris had asked me to write about those moments when social, political, cultural, and environmental concerns form complex Venn diagrams. These are the same kinds of intersections that he and his team of collaborators in Boston and Los Angeles explore in practice and via research as Stoss Landscape Urbanism, the landscape architecture and urban design firm he founded in 2001. The Stoss website says that the firm is committed to quote, the power of open space to bind communities to one another and to the environment. And I really like that term, bind. The kinds of spaces that bind humans and non-humans together, these streets and parks and trails and infrastructure, they feel especially fraught at moment. Um, they're even elemental. Um, air is viral, stormwater wrecks havoc, forests are on fire, and the fate of the earth is uncertain under climate change. So, so why even attempt to design in this context? Um, at Stoss, landscape is considered a catalyst for positive change. It enhances human well being and ecological diversity. This is seen in the work that Chris and his team will share it with us tonight. Across a wide variety of scales, from plantings to benches to neighborhoods, there's an interest in creating public spaces that support equity and bring joy. It's a worthy undertaking, one that might not be strictly about problem solving. Uh, and it's one that I'd like to begin, believe begins with a conversation on the ways that design can instigate some very necessary repair to our frayed urban fabric, not to mention our frayed nerves. Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome Chris, as well as the whole Stoss team. And I look forward to our dialogue after the presentation. Welcome, Chris. Great. Thanks so much, Mimi. Really appreciate that uh, incredibly thoughtful uh, introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, thanks to you to joining us tonight. I look forward to our conversation uh, a little bit later on. Um, I also want to thank Anne Rieselbach and her team, Rafi, Alicia, and others uh, at the Architectural League for inviting us along uh, in some ways to do something we've never done before, um, a kind of virtual office tour where we're featuring the, the offices, the people, the practice, um, the projects in process, um, and doing it from two coasts live. Um, it's, it's actually terrifying uh, what we're doing. So. Um, uh, stick with us. Um, I hope it's uh, insightful and revealing, and I hope it's a little bit of uh, fun. Uh, I'm coming to you from our office in Los Angeles. Um, we've been out here for six years um, in Boston for just over 20 years now. Um, uh, and you'll be uh, along the way tonight, you'll be meeting um, uh, about eight or nine of uh, my colleagues that are actually here on a daily basis doing the work, uh, pushing the work, pushing the ideas, uh, and helping to realize uh, the, the, the work that we're doing. Um, with that, I'll, I'll start and, and share a screen. Great. Um, so I'll start with a little bit of an overview of the firm, uh, founded in 2001. Um, this is a firm, Stoss is a firm really based around ideas, uh, first and foremost. How is it that we can push the boundaries uh, of landscape architecture and design uh, to be catalytic, uh, uh, to have force and impact uh, in shaping and reshaping the world? Um, but this um, uh, belief in ideas is, is complemented by a belief that those same ideas can be enriched and enhanced and interrogated 
uh, through the ways that we engage design process and people and implementation of projects. Uh, from the start, we've had a commitment um, to the physical realization uh, of these ideas and the testing of those ideas um, uh, in the world. And for us, this, this, this relationship between ideas and implementation uh, is very much reciprocal. Uh, the firm started with a prompt uh, about a more expansive role for landscape. Uh, in some ways, looking back uh, to the work of Frederick Law Olmsted and others who were working in the late 19th century, uh, particularly on park systems like uh, the one you see here uh, in Boston, these were systems that were multifunctional. Sure, they were parks, they functioned as habitat, uh, they functioned for recreation, but they integrated flood control, they integrated all sorts of water dynamics, they integrated um, various forms of mobility uh, as well, um, cartways, passageways, roadways, uh, even light rail uh, ways in the case of Boston. Um, and, and they began to shape parts of the city that didn't, didn't formally uh, exist. Uh, and so for us, for me, the, the, the project of landscape has always been an urban project, a project of the city of reshaping uh, lives. And, and it emerged actually from a social reform movement, uh, as many of you know, um, folks really looking to improve the quality of life for people who lived in the city, to offer respite from the working conditions, uh, and to begin to bring uh, life and energy uh, to their daily lives. And so this twinning of a multifunctional set of landscapes that could shape city uh, paired with uh, social reform efforts, I think is really um, uh, where uh, we got our start uh, in many ways. These ideas were then applied uh, early days to, to the contemporary city. How is it that we might, uh, how is it that landscape can, can play a more formative role in the imagining and remaking of public spaces, infrastructures, and entire cities? Um, how is it that we can um, uh, take on the challenges of the 19th century industrial city, of the 20th century infrastructural uh, city? How is it that we can look at this through the lens of the dynamic landscape systems, thinking about ecologies and multifunctional infrastructures to really affect uh, the shape uh, of the city? And so we tested some of these ideas early on, reimagining um, uh, pieces of single-minded infrastructure like the freeways of Los Angeles, uh, really turning them on their heads to become ecological social machines, uh, if you will, stitching together neighborhoods um, uh, and cities uh, and natural environments rather than separating them out, becoming a place for the generation of clean energy, clean water. Uh, etc. We also began to look at the ways in which uh, landscape as a medium, but also landscape as a forum uh, for work uh, and play and living could begin to shape cities. So uh, playing off of some of the work that was already happening on the ground in Detroit, thinking about food, thinking about productive landscapes, how is it that, that the entire city of Detroit might be reshaped uh, through the lens of landscape, a series of successional ecological landscapes that functioned as blue-green infrastructure, that were productive, that could integrate various forms of living and point toward uh, new ways of engaging uh, landscape and natural environments. So at the same time that we were uh, thinking through some of these bigger ideas, um, we were also committed uh, to exploring these ideas at the site scale uh, as well. How is it that the social, uh, the environmental, and the dynamic uh, could come into play on individual sites uh, through individual uh, projects? And, and we did this and continue to do this through using a combination of tools and technologies, both those that exist today uh, and, and some of which are just emerging. Uh, so that we can use the best the disciplines have to offer, uh, but also uh, really capitalize on, on what new technology uh, can do, new technological applications can do uh, for us today. And so these tests, if you will, uh, happening at multiple scales, primarily within the public environment, uh, looking at ways uh, 
even small industrial sites uh, can lend themselves um, to becoming uh, hotspots for biodiversity, for remaking uh, uh, urban um, damage sites, uh, re-inaugurating environmental dynamics on them. How is it that we could begin to look at denuded waterfronts, uh, for instance, allow them to play off the dynamics of rivers that are in play and also form uh, new um, uh, clusters, new magnets for social activity uh, and civic life uh, here in Green Bay? How is it that we could reimagine uh, the infrastructures within the city uh, to become the new center of social life um, at, at a university and city crossroads uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts? How is it that we could uh, work with uh, institutions, cultural institutions, looking to open themselves up both to the environment and to new audiences uh, and begin to reimagine uh, ways in which um, uh, institutions like that may engage their social and environmental context? We've continued to push those ideas, uh, looking in places like LA, um, how is it that some of those same ideas can be applied uh, to public school landscapes, to learning landscapes in arid environments uh, where plant palettes and design strategies are really tuned um, uh, to places where re resources, particularly water, uh, are limited. And how is it that we can play off some of the most impacted uh, industrial sites uh, full of infrastructure and find ways to make them more social and habitable uh, project, recent project that opened with Michael Maltz and Associates at MIT uh, in Cambridge. Along the way, somehow we became furniture designers, as Mimi mentioned, really looking at the ways in which the simple act of sitting could be interpreted and reinterpreted and adapted to different human bodies and moods and tastes, offering um, uh, different ways to interact uh, with the physical environment uh, and different ways to interact with one another. Sometimes these could be scaled up to the scale of the river uh, as at Green Bay. Other times, you know, we're, we're playing off some of the local technologies and, and knowledge uh, that can be put to play here, working with a canoe manufacturer uh, on, on benches and seating uh, made out of fiberglass. We're also, of course, uh, applying some of the most advanced technologies, uh, still though with an eye toward material uh, and texture. Uh, and experience. These days, though, as Mimi um, mentioned, uh, we're facing increased challenges, um, an even more expansive set of challenges and ideas that, that, that we all feel compelled that we need to respond to. Some places have too much water too frequently. Other places have not enough water. Everywhere has too much heat. How is it that landscape can play a role um, in taking on some of these bigger climate challenges? And how is it that we can frankly address and straightforwardly address some of the most pressing social and racial and cultural issues of our time? Asking questions of to whom, for whom can landscape be put uh, in service? Acknowledging too that with change comes tension, comes fear, right? Uh, and, and how is it that we choreograph some of the conversations to allow empathetically uh, people to have their say and to work with them as we begin to imagine uh, futures uh, for their cities. And so this has brought us to a new stage of work, working at very, very large scales. This is in the, the entire island of Galveston off the coast of Texas, subject to sea level rise and hurricanes and all sorts of change, but also subject to incredible economic pressures, which then translate into social, racial, and cultural pressures uh, as well. Or in cities like St. Louis, um, where the social and racial divides are stark, uh, how is it that we might um, uh, finally invest um, in, in places where black and brown people live? How is it that we can help build community around some of the most important institutions to, to those communities? How is it that we can work with those communities to imagine new futures uh, that are joyful uh, and just uh, and beautiful? Those are some of the issues that we're starting to tackle today. And, and on the one hand, it, it's incredibly challenging and daunting. On the other way, uh, on the other hand, um, uh, we have the basic tools and technologies uh, and, and work at hand 
um, uh, engaging with people, engaging with design in order to begin to imagine new futures. So that we're hopeful, we're optimistic. Uh, and what we want to share with you today is a series of projects and processes um, uh, organized around four issues that are really front and center to what we're doing, technologies, resi resilience, forestry, and heritage. Um, and we want to introduce you to some of the people um, uh, that are doing this work uh, today. Again, working out of two offices, I'm going to hand it over now uh, to Lindsay Birch, and you're going to get a sense of, of where we work and who we are. Hi, uh, my name is Lindsay Birch, and I'm the executive assistant for Strauss out of the Boston office. Um, I am here in front of our big book wall right now and uh, to tell you a little bit about the office. Um, our Boston office was founded in 2001 and we've grown from our first location to a repurposed loft like industrial space in South Boston. We're close to the waterfront and just five minutes from the beach and harbor. We're surrounded, our surrounding area is currently undergoing a redevelopment process that honors the area industrial heritage and is beginning to be rebranded as the Ironworks District. Um, it's an accessible location from a range of different neighborhoods with lots of new exciting restaurants, storefronts, and public art installations. Um, the office is an open, flexible space for a flexible space for collaboration. We have a fabrication studio that you'll see some of our colleagues are in there. They'll come to you live from there later. Um, and you can see downtown Boston right from our lovely office. Um, so now I will uh, send it over to Sophie in our LA office. Hi everyone, I'm Sophie Elias, Marketing Manager at Stoss, based in LA. Our LA location is in the Downtown Arts District, which is a former warehouse area surrounded by active industrial uses and wholesale markets. So we're next door to the Fashion District, Toy District, Flower District, and Produce Row. Um, our LA branch was founded in 2016. We have an office in a co-working space here with a great rooftop view of Downtown LA. Um, so we have a design team based here and our directors move between the two offices. Often our projects are run out of both offices simultaneously. We're led by three directors, Chris, Amy, and June, who each bring their own background and expertise to our work. Our leadership team is shown here, including owners, directors, and associates. And here is our full team reunited at our summer retreat. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Mateo, who's gonna dive into our design process and work. Hi, my name is Mateo Young. I'm a senior associate here at the Los Angeles office. Uh, today it's a, 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 a cloudy day, but um, <laughs> hopefully the, the room looks pretty good right now. Um, I have here in my hand some of the tools that we use. These are 3D milled and uh, printed models. And um, I wanted to talk about a little bit of how we use technologies um, in, in our work. Um, we use technology in our day-to-day uh, -day communication uh, between the two offices. We probably go through three or four different platforms just uh, to brainstorm and share ideas and make presentations. Uh, but also uh, we test ideas with digital design explorations that lead to um, implementation of projects with fabrication technologies. And this allows us to experiment with form and create new expressions in the landscape. Um, Today, I'm going to show you a couple of different ways we incorporate technology in our work. Uh, this is Gear Stacker Grove. Um, it's a renovation of an underutilized campus quad at the heart of the University of Michigan's uh, North Campus. Um, this four acre project was conceived to activate and better serve the students by introducing hangout spaces, um, event spaces, and increased biodiversity through uh, the design of the grove. Um, some of these gathering areas include sunny pl uh, plazas and shady passive seating areas uh, embedded in the gardens. Um, and others are more active gathering areas like the sand volleyball court and um, swings that you see in this image. Um, uh, we threaded pathways that connect to buildings and draw students out of the labs into places where um, they can, students can hang out in a lush landscape supported by infiltration rain gardens. And uh, these gardens were um, located in different parts of the site to collect and retain stormwater during um, rain events. Um, 
here's a view of an infiltration basin at night. And um, one of the one of the tools that we used was uh, to amplify the um, experience of seasonal change in the garden. LED lights were uh, programmed and installed within the infiltration basins. Uh, these light fixtures flicker with more intensity as more water is retained in the gardens. Uh, and a weather station reads rainfall and uh, temperature, um, feeding this information to the, the LED rods to activate different light patterns. Um, in this image, we can see the LED lights in the garden and uh, uh, the precast concrete modular benches that help to define the spaces. Um, to design the modular benches, we use the parametric 3D modeling technology to study and develop linear forms that change along its full length and adapting to existing conditions like um, uh, protected trees, proposed topography, uh, program spaces like sand, volleyball court, and en engineered drainage patterns. Um, the bench was developed as a kit of parts. Uh, this creates efficiency in fabrication without fully customizing every piece. Um, <laughs> and here's a diagram showing how the modules come together. Um, the changes along the bench create a diversity of experiences and ways to see it alone um, or in groups. Um, I love this image. Um, we, <laughs> we generate design and forms that are intentional. Um, also, we allow our modeling software and construction technologies to affect the final design, as you can see in the photo. In this image, we can see uh, the threads functioning as an organizing form that defines social spaces and uh, diverse native planting habitats. Um, uh, we use this process in um, many other projects. Uh, for example, this one is a 20 acre high school modernization project here in um, Venice, California um, for the LA Unified School District. Uh, the design was conceived as a series of circulation canals and islands featuring plant beds and landforms for shade trees. Uh, filtering stormwater and framing main quads within the campus. Um, the modular furniture was designed in consideration of unique programmatic uh, uh, and budget needs in this case. Um, here's a photo of uh, um, some colleagues and I uh, looking at benches. We, we generated a th uh, and tested several, several uh, bench modules using Rhino. Um, uh, Mockups were first done using scaled 3D pr printed models and later manufactured at a uh, full scale to test their concrete forms and finishes. Um, the shape of the benches we developed in Venice High School um, facilitates uh, multiple ways to sit in groups um, of different sizes, giving students new way to interact with their friends. They also function um, as gate deterrents. Um, in the past few months, the shape has been used to socially distance um, students and staff. Uh, you can see in the photo on the left, there's a little bit of duct tape on, uh, on the benches that you can't have a seat. Um, uh, with that, I'm gonna um, pass it on to Amy and Grace. Great, thanks Matteo. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Whitesides. I'm the Director of uh, Resilience and Research at STAS. Um, I'm speaking to you tonight from the home office, which is uh, a place that now uh, a number of us like to uh, retreat to on Fridays for some quieter productivity. Uh, it's also getting dark here in Boston, so uh, as I, hopefully I will not fade away as, we, <laughs> as I continue to talk. Um, Grace and I will introduce you to some of our approach to uh, resilience, and you'll see Grace in just a moment. Um, resilience is really at the heart of many of our projects, it's, um, and it's always been an important part of how we work. And for us, resilience is really, it's layered, it's about adaptation to changing climate, reducing risks, and generating new abilities for landscapes and people to bounce back from the risks that we can't avoid. We work on this across scales, uh, next slide. Whether that's at the city scale, developing plans for urban canopy, which Davi will discuss in a little bit, or district-wide adaptation to coastal flooding. And at the site scale, we create elevated parks and embed coastal risk reduction and stormwater management into the landscape. 
Um, and regardless of the scale, it's also about the social and the development of public realm. It's that is accessible, inclusive, and offers really healthy open space and protection from risk, especially for our most vulnerable populations or our most vulnerable neighbors. One of our most exciting projects on the boards right now is Mokley Park. Uh, it's a 60 acre park on the waterfront at Carson Beach in South Boston. The park is a critical link in the Emerald Necklace um, and is at the geographic center of Boston. Next slide. Making it accessible to the entire communities. You can see, can see that here. Um, next. And yet the park and the beach have not always been welcome to everyone. Uh, here in this image, you see black beachgoers being kept away from the beach by police and a series of protests that then resulted. Next. And the immediate neighbors of the park often don't use it. They're kept away largely by lack of inclusive programming and the challenge of crossing two large roadways that separate the park from its surroundings. Next. These neighbors are predominantly minority, falling into multiple environmental justice categories, indicating social vulnerability and greater risk of not being able to recover from climate-based impacts such as flooding and heat. Uh, today, the park is dominated by athletics programming, as seen here with a rugby game, and it's really challenged by high groundwater. Next slide, which leads to these fields being flooded every time it rains rendering them unusable for play. Next. In addition, um, the park is uh, part of a series of flood pathways that bring coastal waters into the city, flooding not only the immediate neighborhood, but um, parts of Roxbury and the South End as well. So a very large portion of the city. Next. <clears throat> and despite being threatened by this coastal flooding, the park also feels really far away and disconnected from the unique culture of the urban beach, which is just steps away. The vision for the park developed over the last few years seeks to remedy these issues through enhanced programming, integration of coastal flood protection and improved stormwater management systems, among other benefits. This vision was developed through engagement with the local community, understanding their hopes and their dreams for the park. Um, and this included a monthly park cleanup, which we began in order to develop trust and show commitment to a future that includes better management and maintenance of this community asset and really to give something to the community today while this park, which is a very long term plan uh, comes to fruition. This engagement helped us to develop a series of goals for the design with um, inclusivity as an overarching goal. We then sought to embed recreation and play, community health and well-being, as well as resilience and an improved um, ecology uh, into every aspect of the park. These amenities are organized into three zones, the city edge, which connects to the neighborhood, the core and crest, which hosts the coastal protection system, athletics programming and playgrounds, and the coastal park, which links the park to the beach. Each of these was developed through 3D and physical modeling, which Grace will show you from the conference room back at Stoss. Hi, thank you, Amy. I'm Grace, um, Sharon and Taraz. Uh, and here, we're welcome to our conference room. So here is where the team comes together and have our design. Um, staffing meetings and workshops. So here on the screen, you can see our working mirror board and our drawings on the pinup wall. And of course, here are very large physical models on our working table. And these models have been such a great tool for us through, through the design, where we really can get into the detail of the design. So let's take a closer look. We work with the models at different scales. So from the scale of the smallest scale of the 3D prints where we test different options to these lar larger scale of one inch to 10 feet large models. And in here we can really test and understand how the topography and the design works. So here you can see how the lower marsh area surrounded by the higher dunes and the coastal landscape. Here on the higher ground, you can see the old harbor overlook that looks over the coastal landscape here with great views to also the beach and the harbor. On the other side of the park, we have the stadium. 
And here at the stadium, we really work with to preserve this um, existing stadium seating here. So we reoriented the field and also added topography and dense planting to create shaded seating areas with views to the game, but also to the water as well. Along the street, as Amy mentioned, is the city edge. And the city edge, we really focus on community programming and inclusive um, programming. So here with this break in the tree, is a great entryway into the park. And you can see here the different playgrounds and the event areas of the park. These models have been such a great tool for us to look at the design at the larger scale, but also really get down to the detail of the sectional scale. So here you can see our promenade with the running track strips and also these tree-lined um, pathways. These models have been such an important part in our design process, and we really hope to be able to show this to you and the public in person soon. We really want them to see how their input has been incorporated into our design. And Amy will and really imagine their park and see their neighborhood park and what it might be. So Amy's gonna talk more about how we implement these designs um, into the larger concept. Thank you. Thanks, Grace. So each of these zones that we mentioned take on one or more of the key aspects of resilience that we want to embed into the park. So the city edge, which is all about connecting to the community through enhanced programming, includes multiple forms of stormwater management from porous paving and tree trenches along the roadway to stormwater meadows and underground storage systems below the fields. It's also where the community really comes together. They're connecting with one another and can find new activities such as community gardens, basketball courts, and a community center that doubles as a resilience hub with cooling stations, Wi-Fi, an opportunity for things like vaccination and testing sites and other means of assistance during future emergencies that you know we don't we can't yet imagine. The Corn Crest holds all the athletic programs. Uh, improved through new surfacing and lighting and other amenities, as well as a new adventure playground. All of this is protected by a raised berm with a core wall that is embedded and protects against the risk of future coastal flooding. This elevated line acts as protection, but also program. So for example, we have sledding in the winter or on the coastal side, we have an amphitheater that allows for events and just enjoying a view over to the beach. The coastal park is the connection back to the beach and it's designed to get wet. So it's you know responsive to sea level rise and coastal storms as they move through, as you sort of saw in the previous image. It supports a variety of coastal landscapes, dunes, wetlands, and programming, such as the amphitheater and a community barbecue area that, that Grace just showed you. Um, we have a quick little video that illustrates how the landscape allows for water of all kinds. So collecting stormwater as it rains and um, then seawater moves as seawater moves in with storms and then flows back out again with the tide. The landscape is really meant to be uh, resilient to this kind of flooding and the, these processes uh, and changing over time with them. And lastly, we see the park here from the north looking back on the new coastal landscape, the maintenance yard and core wall sort of running down the length of the park with the ball fields, playgrounds, and the city edge all protected from flooding on the landward side. Our hope is that it can really become a true community park for the neighbors of South Boston, as well as a citywide destination, connecting all of Boston's residents to the beautiful environment of the harbor and providing healthy recreational options and community events for folks to enjoy for years to come. So I'm gonna pass it off to Sue, uh, who I believe is in the studio in Boston. Uh, thank you, Amy and Grace. Uh, that's a nice introduction of the resiliency and Mokui Park. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sushin, a senior associate at Stoss. Uh, as you can see, uh, I'm sitting on my desk in Boston office. Uh, it's one large open space that um, facilitates easy collaboration among staffs. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, Darby Chern, 
who also work as a PM and associate in LA office. Uh, he's not physically with me today, but you will see him in the video in a second. Um, we are here to talk about some of our ongoing work that engages with the question of urban forests at, at a variety of scales. Uh, through a set of larger scale planning projects that we will, that we will help define urban forestry, uh, why it matters urbanistically, and our approach to forestry. Uh, you will see this through two projects. First, the Urban Forest Plan, where we are guiding a strategy approaches for managing and planning for city whole forests. Um, second, uh, with the Urban Forest Equity Collaborative in Los Angeles, uh, which proposed that typological approaches and strategies for public right of ways. After that, I'll follow with the Urban Forest Design Demonstration Project, a small park in Cambridge that will be finished next spring. Uh, with that, uh, let's hear from Davi about Urban Forestry. So what is an urban forest? An urban forest refers to all the trees in the city. These include trees on both public and private lands, from the trees in city parks to those in your front and backyard, from campuses to cemeteries and everything in between. And we depend on trees in the urban forest to perform a range of functions for both residents and ecosystems. This includes providing shade on a hot summer day, cleaning the air we breathe, reducing flooding by capturing rainwater, and creating social spaces of shared beauty and meaning. Approaching the trees within a city as an urban forest also more closely reflects the dynamics, of the natural systems that determine the health of those trees. And the compounding impacts of climate change make planning and designing for the health of this urban scale infrastructural system ever more critical. Across our work on urban forestry, we're constantly looking at the relationship between social and environmental factors. Uh, and in both Boston and LA, uh, we're particularly focused on addressing questions of equity as it relates to the urban forest, which often begins with understanding the ways in which historically excluded and socially vulnerable communities, such as those with high rates of linguistic isolation, which you see mapped here, uh, are more likely to live in neighborhoods with limited canopy or can it be in poor or declining health and the various health and environmental implications of these realities. Uh, and these sorts of correlations are all too common across American cities, the product often of discriminatory policies and practices, including redlining, uh, which you can see mapped on the right here onto sites of our current work in LA, uh, one of which you can see on the left, uh, as well as other similar practices. Um, which have led to landscapes that reflect histories of disinvestment uh, in the inequitable distribution of canopy today. And while the underlying dynamics are often similar across sites, both responding uh, to the social and environmental context uh, in specific ways is critical to this work, uh, with the temperate landscapes of the Northeast or the arid landscapes of Southern California presenting different kinds of challenges uh, and everywhere climate change compounding the numerous health crises at play when considering urban forests uh, with the coming hotter summers, more frequent severe storms, and more flooding. And with that, I'll pass it back to Sue. Um, as we learn about urban forest planning, um, I'm moving into a smaller scale project here and would like to introduce the Triangle Park, um, one acre urban forest project in Cambridge. Massachusetts, uh, located in Massachusetts, uh, which just started the construction. Uh, the city of Cambridge released their urban forest plan in 2019. Triangle Park is the first demonstration stemming from this forest plan. As such, it addresses the need for increased urban canopy while critically addressing urban heat island effect on biodiversity. Also, as you can see in your screen, uh, park is creating both active and passive recreation, accommodating small program events, as well as providing quiet spaces for the community to sit, eat lunch, and enjoy a burden respite. Um, we have a short animation that visualizes how the park uh, matures over time, and it's designed to handle stormwater. Um, 
So urban forest has a multi-layered structure with the different growth rates, especially buried trees on the left side of the image will grow much faster than the others. And some of them are intentionally called to make space for others to survive. After monitoring for 10 years succession, the forest become autonomous and provide a sustainable natural habitat. The Burmese not only create a um, small gathering spaces, but also contains the water retention along with the permeable surface under the urban growth area. And uh, this will improve the park's weather resilience. Um, also, uh, with the variety of tree species, the forest also provide a seasonal interest as well. I think the last part of the video is not here, here but um, so upon the completion of this fully remediated site will add almost 400 new trees and 15 new tree species to the locale, providing a welcoming of urban forest refuse in the heart of the city. Uh, for conclusion, uh, we believe urban forest operates and impacts the social lives and ecological function of cities at a range of scale. Our work mirrors this reality and allows us to engage this project with the varied focuses, sites, and scales. Uh, while the urban forest is a critical infrastructure in its own right, addressing the forest allow also allows for engagement with the various other infrastructure that shapes patterns of urbanization, from transportation system to public open space, and for, um, from stormwater to housing. Together, our ongoing work on this project and site aims to produce healthier, more environmentally resilient and happier city, both today and into uncertain future. Um, with that, I will uh, hand over to Chelsea, who is in our work, work room in the office. Awesome. Thanks, Sue. And uh, by extension, Davi, uh, it's really great to hear about the research and to also hear more about Triangle Park. We're super excited as it goes into construction. So my name is Chelsea Kilburn. I'm a project manager here at Stoss. I'm here with my colleague June, also in the workroom. Oh, it's my turn. Oh, hi, uh, I'm June. Uh, I'm also in the workroom with Chelsea. Um, I'm a studio and technical director, uh, primarily stationed in Boston, but um, um, but oversee office-wide projects uh, in both offices and supporting design teams uh, through conceptualization and to the implementation of the old projects that we're working on. Uh, in this section, we're going to uh, briefly talk about two projects. Um, typically, because uh, <clears throat> oftentimes our work. Uh, is you know, it's very interesting and yet very complicated site. And, um, you know, so that, that we wanted to share how the site's unique and history context, uh, history and context inform our process and outcome. Uh, we'll look at two projects uh, that addresses uh, adaptive reuse of a formerly industrial site, one in the Boston and one in New York State. Uh, next slide, please. The first of the two project is L Street Waterfront, uh, a project located in South, uh, South Boston Waterfront near our office. The site, which was previously a power station, is part of a large mixed use development to reimagine and reconnect the waterfront of this formerly industrial site to the wider neighborhood. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the aerial photo uh, shows the current condition of the site. Uh, Portions of the power plant building, such as turbine hull and coal storage, et cetera, will be protected and repurposed to create various civic and communal spaces, as well as the gantry crane uh, will also be remain to become a landmark uh, that can remind the industrial history of the place. We also wanted to uh, you know, preserve some sections of existing seawall uh, you know, that could uh, provide a unique uh, experience uh, getting closer to the water, as well as uh, you know, become a backdrop of a submersible wetland that could also withstand uh, sea level rise, as well as like a big storm effects. Um, next slide, please. Uh, one of the tools that uh, we like to utilize in helping us understand the site conditions and opportunities uh, is layering and accumulation of information. As this in, uh, animation progresses, you can uh, trace the layers inherent in this site, 
such as the existing utilities structure and see how they inform the final concept design. Drawing the exist existing conditions uh, gives them value and marks their place. Kelsey? Uh, so again, you can see the existing conditions as they exist here. The site is quite dilapidated currently, but it features a number of really interesting relics that speak to the site's former industrial use. So on the next slide, we have um, a couple of photos that show these really massive elements. June mentioned some things like uh, relics from the turbine hall um, and then also the gantry crane that we wanted to keep at the waterfront. So some of these relics were repurposed into different markers and art pieces on site that you can see here in this section, um, but also ex are uh, situated um, alongside the elements that need to really serve the site in the future um, as we think about sea level rise. Um, in the next slide, you can see how uh, we really wanted to activate this site um, to maintain uh, these distinct pieces of the site's cultural heritage, to make them visible, and to really give the site uh, a sense of vibrancy through the different seasons as we activate it with programming and hope to connect it to the larger South Boston neighborhood. Um, so again, thinking about how we can do this throughout the year um, to bring a lot of vibrancy to this really amazing site. And then June is going to speak about the next project. <laughs> All right, thank you, Chelsea. Uh, the second project we want to share with you uh, also takes uh, place on a former home of uh, Standard Gauge Company, uh, Metal Fabricators. Um, we are working with a mass design group uh, in Boston to envision this site as a new workspace uh, for Scenic Hudson in Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here we have an overview map. Uh, to look at the project. Uh, for those of you uh, who may not be uh, familiar with the, the area, Poughkeepsie is a small flutter city along the Hudson River um, that has experienced urban renewal and uh, been divided by highways. The city is in, uh, although the, though the city is investing in a lot of uh, trail infrastructure that follows the lines of historic railroads and uh, Fall Creek, uh, Fall Kill Creek, I'm always having a hard time pronouncing this, uh, which you can see highlighted in green and blue, uh, respectively. Uh, next slide. Uh, more specific to the landscape, uh, we are interested in featuring uh, key layers inherent to the site. A series of railroads uh, formerly ran through the site, uh, connecting the site to this, the larger city and the city to the larger industrial region. Uh, the orange line uh, lines uh, shown here represent the former uh, rail lines, uh, we, which uh, we use to organize site circulation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then we also wanted to uh, respect. Uh, I want to uh, respect the existing topography and the geology. Uh, we have a very shallow uh, depths of bedrock and contaminated soil on site. Uh, so you will see in the future slides. Uh, how we create a series of berms that, that help keep the dirty soil on site while creating and defining out the room's various activities. Yeah, thanks, June. So as you saw in those photos, we have sort of a history of um, resources to pull from that speak to the industrial history of this site. And here in this sort of future overview and vision for the site, we really hope to reinvigorate this place through new plantings. And as June mentioned, a series of berms that not only can cap the contaminated soil on site, which was one of the goals of the client to really be, um, you know, kind to the environment in this place, um, but it also creates a new section through the site, a series of outdoor rooms that um, the public can utilize as well as um, those working in this space. And there's also really great bones in the building. So a lot of this project seeks to reuse uh, materials from demolition that we're selectively doing in the project. Um, and those materials we hope to um, uh, invest in the landscape. So in the next slide, you'll see that there's um, some really amazing uh, spaces that we hope to create like this rubble garden along the side where we could think about reclaiming um, uh, field stone that might be excavated on this site. And then we're also thinking about how we might use things like crushed brick or uh, reclaimed pieces of timber from within the building to accent the site, which you'll see in these final images. 
Um, so a lot of really great pieces to work with here that that bring out the, the sort of cultural presence of the site and speak to the character of Poughkeepsie that we're really excited about. Um, so like technology and equity uh, are some of the methods that we use to inform our design work. Heritage is another way that we really hope to, as Mimi said, you know, bind communities to each other and then our communities to the environment. So I'll kick it back to Chris uh, for closing remarks. Great. Uh, thanks to everybody. Um, I hope you've gotten a good sense of the team that's at work and that's a small portion of the team and the personalities uh, that are brought to bear every day on these projects uh, and the real sweep of the work uh, that we're doing. I mean, in all of this, I think uh, you can see uh, this more expansive role and import uh, for landscape and landscape practices uh, as we go forward, taking on some of the most pressing environmental, social and racial challenges uh, of our time. And yet this is work uh, that's very clearly and intentionally informed and enriched by the craft uh, of landscape, the more timeless uh, spatial cultural material pursuits uh, of the discipline. With that, I'll thank you all for your attention and uh, pitch it back to Mimi um, for a little bit of conversation. Great. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, everybody in this team. That was an amazing orchestration of both two uh, bi-coastal living and uh, working and everything. So uh, I really got a sense of, of what the studio might be like, uh, studios might be like. So thank you. Um, I want to start perhaps thinking thinking about, especially since uh, Chelsea and June's final presentation was thinking about heritage. Um, you know, I think you're you're looking at these uh, conditions of 19th century and 20th century um, cities that we've kind of inherited certain kinds of urbanisms. Um, and then the work has to respond and mitigate, um, be resilient to the after effects of, of those choices. Uh, and I wonder within that, um, what is the role then of speculation on the 21st century, um, you know, sort of as, as we're sort of contending with what has happened and needing to make and maybe even repair, um, how does one then also sort of move forward? Yeah, that's 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 quite the question. Um, and so All much- the questions, right? <laughs> yeah, right, thanks, Mimi. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the looking back is important, the looking at the existing is important, the, the dealing with what is in place and especially who is in place uh, as a starting point uh, is incredibly important. But I think, you know, beyond all that, um, we also have an obligation to bring our own aspirations uh, for a future, our own um, training our own set of technologies, our own, you know, design pursuits, uh, for lack of a better term, um, uh, to begin to help to imagine these new futures. I don't think this is just about repairing the environment, although landscape certainly can play a role in that. I don't think it's just about healing communities, the landscape and the design planning process can play a role in that. Um, I think, though, that we need to bring our own cultural agendas to that as well, cultural explorations, design explorations, uh, almost the project of design behind the other projects that, that design needs to take on uh, as one way to forge ahead and to begin to invent and aspire and imagine uh, new futures. That can happen at multiple scales, right? Um, and it's not absent all of what we're taking into account, right? But it is projecting toward a future that doesn't yet uh, uh, exist. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, that balance between sort of like, say, what it, what what is going to get us to that future um, kind of leads into this other question that I have is around the role of technology. Like, um, to, to what, you know, I think the, the because that, that connects to the kind of ideas of design, right? That certainly certain uh, elements within the projects sort of are shaped 
shape and are shaped by the technologies that you're using, whether that is the way that something is being modeled um, or something is being rendered, um, or even sort of what available sort of tools for making are there. And, and I was wondering within that, you know, are there emerging technologies that you're looking at that you think might be game changers within the field um, that could point us to uh, so those new features that we're maybe thinking about, uh, I, I've been thinking about the questions of augmented reality or questions of AI yep. um, in, in, in relationship to landscape. And, and I wonder to what degree those begin to enter the conversation. Yeah, I think, I, I think that's exactly right on the edge of, of where we are and where we might be going to. I think we have to be cautious and careful on the one hand about that. There have been projects that that went all in um, on uh, AI and, and measuring and collecting data and all that. And frankly, you know, having every move that you make through the day in your daily personal life monitored and measured is, is quite scary and frankly intrusive, right? So there, there are places where that can go too far. Um, but I think there are um, uh, opportunities uh, to, to really carefully look at uh, responsive technologies, interactive technologies, aug augmented technologies that help us to, to kind of project a new future. I mean, that, that lighting feature that Matteo was describing at the University of Michigan is such a tiny little hint uh, of, of something that's responsive in the environment. It uses quite simple technology to bring to life, right, through, through lighting and technology, something that's make, going on in the environment and, and frankly, making a, 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 a physical or experiential connection between people uh, and the environment. For, for me, uh, I, I think for many of us, if, if, if somehow it can be used to enhance people's experience um, of each other, uh, of the environment, of the city, I think those are the places that, that we can put those technologies um, uh, to good use. But that's, that's really on the, on the cutting edge. I mean, in so many ways we need to get, I think, I, th I think sometimes um, our lens, our, the landscape discipline is shy to, to, even though we're using some of the same, you know, rhino grasshopper technology, sometimes um, our discipline is a little shy about allowing that to be evident in the form that's produced, right? And I think for us, um, uh, really allowing whatever technology that we're utilizing, whether it's handcraft or, or something digital uh, through fabrication, I think it's really important to allow that to have expression um, uh, within uh, the design, within the landscape that we're producing, again, as a way to connect people to, to where we are now and where we might be going um, uh, in the future. Well, I think that I, I like that you brought up the example of the LEDs because in a way, that's a fair, that kind of sensor technology we've become pretty um, acclimatized to um, at this point. But but it does introduce a kind of um, temporal aspect to the project, right? That the the park, uh, the outdoor space that we often sort of think as a daytime uh, piece is is now being able to activate uh, at night, right? That it, it has these kind of um, so the 24 seven kind of way of operating. And that sort of leads me to a question around programming. And, and um, I, I know that there has been debates in landscape in the discipline around programming for many years. Um, but rather than kind of debate program, I, I wanna maybe ask around uh, the role of public participation in Sort of getting to the kind of programming, like what what is that connection with stakeholders, community members, clients? Like, how how does this ideation process uh, happen? I can I can jump in on that. I mean, I think increasingly it happens in a lot of different ways. I mean, especially you know we see with COVID. Um, we've had to completely rework how we go about community engagement, you know, and in some ways that that has been uh, better, you know, we've had 
it's easier for someone to listen in on something just from home, you know, so there's kind of a, a shift there, but, um, you know, but then other people are left out from that. And I think that's the key is that no single method of how we engage the public is going to ensure that we reach really uh, the broadest, you know, set of individuals, right? So having a kind of I think the process of engagement has to be iterative in the same way that the process of design is iterative. So we have to see, you know, who did we who did we connect to? Did we get meaningful feedback? You know, did we get did we provide enough opportunities? And then, you know, kind of re, rework and realign what we're doing. Um, and I would say, you know. Programming really is, I think, the one of the places where public engagement really has a tremendous role to play in landscape. You know, it's it's important. Um, you know, in the landscape, it is so important that people people are going to come and use this thing, whatever it is, and so that activities that are there feel inclusive and address the issues. You know, the interests and issues of the community. As opposed to, you know, engagement where we might be getting feedback on a specific design element, you know, that that tends to be kind of less useful engagement feedback. So I really do think programming, you know, it's kind of the key place where we do get a lot of, of community engagement. Um, and it really does happen early on, you know, it's kind of the, the at the beginning reaching out to people and understanding what what is your vision for this place how would you how would you like to engage it what's not there now and sometimes we do that by getting people out on site you know and i think that can be a really great way to get a different kind of response than say what a person might say in a meeting you know or what just sitting at their house to be able to actually kind of watch what people do while they're out on the site um, and then being able to draw that and then have them kind of respond again, you know, to, oh, yeah, that's, that's, you know, it's kind of capturing my sort of my vision. Um, so again, you know, it starts to become like a, a kind of iterative loop of, of working with people and talking with, talking with them. And, and then the last thing I'll say about that as well is we, we increasingly have um, forms of engagement that are about building trust and building communication between the client and the community, because that's the relationship that lasts in most cases, right? It, especially because we work for cities but much of the time, the city and the community really have an ongoing relationship, hopefully of trust, you know, that is what will continue to, to live on. And so um, you know, finding ways in which the forum is about dialogue uh, between them can begin to start to create, you know, kind of just better lines of communication around what is happening in the, in in their community and what are their, you know, what are their future needs. I, I think um, one of the things that you mentioned, Amy, when in your presentation had to do with like creating a space that might get then repurposed, you know, to be a vaccine site, or you know, that there's this. Um, flexibility or even a kind of um, need to sort of shift gears um, within these uh, landscapes pretty pretty quickly. And, and I was wondering if you have sort of reflections on how, um, on, on what kind of inventiveness has had to come up under COVID and how that might get reflected um, in some of the projects that you're working on now. Looks like Chris has got a got a thought. Yeah, I think um, I mean the the um, almost instantaneous ways that parks and open spaces flipped roles um, to accommodate testing sites, medical facilities. You saw this right in the heart of Central Park, right? That that the parks could um, uh, accommodate. Um, uh, immediate pressing emergency needs um, that they could be rallied in a way to, to serve other purposes than they were ever intended to serve. Um, it, for Central Park, it wasn't the first time that that kind of um, medical use uh, happened, but you saw that happening quite, quite instantaneously. 
Um, I think what we also saw during COVID, particularly early days, was um, a little bit of worry based on the science at the time that, that um, smaller scale spaces, playground spaces, those sort of neighborhood open spaces um, uh, could be risky. And so those were all shut down, right? Um, and, and left were some of the bigger open spaces, the linear open spaces in cities uh, and, and systems that were in play. And, and those allowed people to spread out um, people inventively put markers around in order to kind of do that uh, in a safe way and a playful way. Um, but I think at that moment, what we saw was um, uh, this need to really think about everything from the, the width of a single pathway, right? Um, thinking ahead about who's going to be walking in which direction and, and, and spacing and those sorts of things um, to who had access to those larger scale parks uh, and linear systems. In Boston, um, you know, there's some fabulous open space systems. The waterfront that, that Moakley uh, attaches to is amazing. The, the Emerald Necklace is amazing, but there's a huge gap in the middle there, right? And, and those are lower income people, as you might imagine, those are people that are um, more prone to public health uh, issues. Um, uh, that have been disinvested in the past. And so it, it, it kind of reminded us that, that, you know, big parks matter and big parks need to be accessible to all communities and all people. And so the idea of then retooling cities uh, to at least create um, safe connections, green connections to some of these bigger park systems through the heart of some of the most impacted neighborhoods, right, is one level of city scale. At another level, the, the, the whole idea of, of, of having parks that have multiple pathways through multiple places to go that create, um, again, diverse experiences within the park on the, on the one hand, but also places where people don't have to pass so closely together uh, on the other hand. So, there are plenty of lessons we can begin to, to move forward. We're still obviously dealing with the impact of an ongoing pandemic. I think there'll be a lot of inventiveness coming out of that. Um, but I think, um, you know, in all our work, um, you know, in thinking about flexibility, no matter at what scale, we're, we're anticipating, we're guessing at how parks might be used in flexible ways. Um, but we also know we can't possibly imagine all of it, right? Um, and so leaving some room for, for open-endedness, for, for, for space for others to begin to adapt and appropriate, I think is really important as well. Yeah. Um, oh, go so, ahead. Uh, um, just quickly, the, one of the things I'm really heartened by is the kind of the, the quick you know, the quick adaptation, relatively quick adaptation that happened, you know, with restaurants, like popping out into the street, streets in Cambridge, you know, suddenly that are, have terrible traffic flow suddenly became one way, you know, because now half the street is taken up by restaurants. We have in the back of our office, um, when you go out into the parking lot, some days there's a, this silent um, spin class that's happening out there underneath the tent. So there's, you know, 50 people on bikes in the parking lot, at, you know, at night. <laughs> it's like, it's this really um, kind of cool, you know, adaptation of spaces that I think we as landscape architects have often been telling clients, you know, use this space temporarily while you're about to build the thing that is going to be. And I, and I think, it all too frequently doesn't happen. You know, we are, we're often kind of showing these phasing plans and it can be something before it's another thing. And it, it kind of, you know, it's hard to imagine or the permitting is difficult or whatever. And I, I think COVID, my hope is that COVID has loosened some of that rigidity around just because I set something up, it isn't permanent and rigidity around the permitting process and the idea that, you know, if we want to test what changing a street might be like, we could test that at scale, not just a parking, not just a like one single parking spot, but the entire street. And let's just do it for two months, you know, or whatever it is. And, and I think that's my hope, you know, that there's some, there's some shift that could happen there as a result. I love that idea of testing at scale. Um, and, and maybe even demanding that things get tested at scale. I, I was just in Chicago 
um, talking to David Brown about um, an old, the Olmsted plan that was never implemented uh, for greenways in South Chicago, um, and how that becomes, you know, both an infrastructural uh, issue as well as a very clearly an equity um, issue. Uh, and some of the work he's doing is trying to figure out those ways to demand that a testing at scale uh, might happen. Uh, it always seems to come back to Olmsted, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> like it or like it or not. Uh, I, I want to switch a little bit to um, uh, to the Q and A, and I'll just put out there that um, that uh, Bess had a question, uh, which kind of echoes. I, I was curious about the bicoastal, and um, Bess has a question about plans um, to address the unhoused living in LA parks, and and perhaps maybe uh, I'll, I'll sort of add to that thinking about those very real conditions in in park spaces right now um, around inclusion and equity. Yeah, that's among. Um one of the hardest problems to solve right now, right? Um, and, and it really tests the limits of what, a, what landscape architecture can do, what design can do, right? On the one hand, there are ways in which we can begin to imagine um, uh, uh, open spaces that, that humanely recognize those populations, right? Um, and provide services um, that are are very useful to, 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 to unhoused populations. Um, in Pittsburgh, um, in a project with the Uptown Eco Innovation District, we're looking at the ways in which the exterior spaces around social service um, uh, agencies could be retooled and reimagined, not only to, to <laughs> To just have places to sit for people while they're waiting for to, to to get into the social service agency, but maybe there are other accommodations as well, like showers and and um, uh, things that just address people's basic needs. How is it that that environments can be retooled to recognize um, those those needs? I I think it's a great space for landscape architects uh, to be in, to be exploring, to really pushing in the ways that COVID allowed us to test different ways to inhabit the street. How is it that, that uh, through the lens of, of the unhoused, we can reimagine um, other ways to inhabit the public realm, uh, if not parks, streets, alleys, all the things that make up the public realm. Um, but, but it really kind of pushes the limit because at the end of the day, landscape architecture as a discipline is not gonna solve the economic issues that are at the heart of all that, right? There are bigger political economic uh, issues in play. Uh, I think our work as advocates for these issues is really important. Um, and so the advocacy through the work and just simply ad advocacy as people uh, is really important. Um, uh, but we need to be teaming, partnering with people who are also controlling policy and, and, and other mechanisms, uh, as Amy was uh, referring to, uh, how is it that we can partner with those groups to, to, to help them ease the stigma or, or, or tension or apprehension around um, some of the regulations that are in place and, and kind of uh, think about um, uh, these issues in the public realm in a far more inclusive and inventive way. It's a difficult solutionism, I think, is something to be a little wary of when, when dealing with these sort of um, multifaceted uh, sort of social, political uh, and uh, conditions, but I, but I do think questions of shade and, and sort of urban forestry uh, go a long way to thinking about what life on the street is for everyone. I think I, I you know, excited that that's something you're addressing. Um, I've been asked to ask everybody to turn their cameras on. Um, and, uh, and if anybody has a question, um, feel free to unmute um, and, and I see that Anne just raised her hand. So I, I'll, I'll let you take well, the first one. Oh, I mean, one of our, our long running conversations that Chris and I've had and I've had with other landscape architects is unlike architecture, when you sort of finish a landscape project, it's just starting in many respects. So what I wonder is, and you've covered this a little bit in your discussion just now, 
about homelessness and COVID and kind of re-looking at the space, but do, do you on a regular basis go back through in a kind of post-occupancy way um, and revisit the parks, look at how people are using it, it, get surprised probably at some things, retool things. I mean, how do you have a kind of ongoing relationship with parks as they, as they grow and change through time? Yeah, it's such a good question. Uh, and in fact, early on, we, we as, as we were thinking more expansively about practice, we we're including the idea that we need to have longer ongoing uh, relationships with clients uh, and projects in order to kind of test and tune things over time, right? Um, you know, we've had the privilege in a, in a few instances um, when, when projects are built in the places that we live and work um, to actually visit them on a regular basis. Um, so the plaza at Harvard is probably the best one because I think half the staff lives in Cambridge and walks through that project on the way to the T and, and Amy and I are over there teaching all the time. And so you can really watch how people behave in that space, which is really, really interesting. Um, I think we did some earlier test gardens. Um, this is where garden festivals are really great. Uh, we created some abstract landscapes and just watched how people engaged them uh, in, in, in ways that they, they were encountering something that was a little bit unfamiliar uh, and, and, and yet started to kind of, through their own curiosity, appropriate those spaces in different ways. So at the scale of the, the, the human, right, how, how people interact with each other and with these environments is something that we um, uh, can test at that, at that garden festival. Uh, we had somebody f photographing for us all the time. We can experience that um, in uh, uh, at the Harvard Plaza um, in partnership with the Landscape Architecture Foundation. They have a program they call CSI, uh, which studies sites post occupancy uh, and really evaluates them from an environmental and now social basis based on the terms that that we and the client team have defined for a project. They have um, uh, university faculty and students going back to look at those over time and really seeing how some of those metrics played out. I think, I think you know, to tie that to, to, to Mimi's earlier question on technology, how is it that we might have monitoring devices in landscape, not to monitor people, but actually to monitor the behavior of the landscape itself, the conditions of soil, wetness, heat, those sorts of things. How can that be used uh, to feed back uh, into the work we're doing? Um, there's a guy named Craig Douglas at the GSD who's starting to, to, to install that kind of um, uh, equipment in, in real living landscapes to kind of give uh, uh, design teams uh, feedback loops for all of that. But I, I think there's something there um, that could absolutely help to inform the work. I mean, part of the, um, part of the idea of, frankly, the work, but, but the, um, the book project that, that Mimi mentioned uh, very early on called Mise en Seine, that, that the idea behind that and, and what we're doing is that we're encountering these environments that are already, there are things already in play, right? Environmentally, socially, culturally, politically, economically, that's kind of the ground, that's the stage. Um, there are things that are always in process, in action. And, and in some ways, our, our job is to understand what that is, to fine tune it, right? Um, uh, in some ways to play off it, uh, to create designs that, that kind of interact with that, but also create new futures. And then kind of, you know, on the one hand, step back and allow that life to begin to evolve, right? Uh, previously, people thought about that as, oh, well, the landscape will simply grow. Uh, absolutely. Hopefully it'll also start to evolve and adapt environmentally and socially as well and, and having a kind of life beyond the project and ability every now and then to, to, to not only learn from it but, but to help curate uh, many other futures I think I, I, I think is really a fascinating opportunity for all of us as designers. Right. Uh, I was wondering if there was any other questions that folks can just jump in if they're interested. Or raise a hand or drop something in the chat. I don't want to. Uh, 
I don't want to cut anyone off. I, I had a question around uh, if no if no one else does, I you know, I have a whole list. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was, one of the things that we have at the different scales that we've talked about, um, we actually haven't talked about plantings um, very much, uh, actually really at all in this conversation. And I was wondering if we wanted to talk a little bit about the kind of, you know, at the scale of particular plants about how that may suggest habitat or interspecies connections. Um, you know, if we're talking about inclusion, is this inclusion of, you know, sort of a multi-species, um, you know, in the park and how do you, how you begin to foster or curate that? Yeah, that's great. Who wants to take that? Kelsey, you want to weigh in? Just like, what, who, me? Did you, did you ask me, Chris? Yeah, sure, come on. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm trying, I'm trying to think about a, an appropriate answer right now. Um, I'm honestly, I come from an architecture background and I feel like I'm learning a lot about planting. Um, the, following the work with the Urban Canopy Project and Triangle Park has been very interesting. So I feel like I'm learning a lot there. I've learned about bare root trees. And I think Sue mentioned this in the project, um, the idea of sort of um, over planting and then, you know, beginning to sort of call a site and what that might mean for the succession of a site. So maybe that doesn't speak to individual species uh, in particular, but to a process that involves a type of planting. Um, and that, as she mentioned, is just sort of underway now. And so I think I hope to see, you know, the life of that project sort of play out in, in some sort of uh, longer period of time. So maybe yeah. it's not the answer you're looking for, but. <laughs> no, it's, it's interesting, though, because it's a, it's a great starting point. Amy, I'm thinking of the work in Edmonton right now where um, on the one hand, we're engaging indigenous communities to really understand their understanding of landscape and medicinal plants, right? But also, you know, the fact that the project needs to accommodate some pretty significant wildlife corridors as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, I was going to, I was going to mention that. I think that's been an interesting one, um, you know, where the indigenous community has, um, you know, a long history of utilization of these plants and plants that just the presence of those plants, you know, really has cultural meaning. Um, and so for them, you know, there's been a, a decent amount of input around how can, how can some of those plants be brought into the landscape and potentially even for harvest, not in a farming kind of way, you know, not in a, not in a community garden kind of way, but in a sort of usable landscape, which I think you know, it's really exciting um, and not something that is typical, <laughs> you know, um, you know, it's, I think very challenging that, okay, how, how could that happen in a landscape like this? So we're, you know, we're working through that. Um, but also in the urban forest plan, I think is, is another interesting um, example, more about the, the question you had about relationships to plants where you know, we have a we've built this kind of community advisory board that's made up of um, you know people who work within the city, people who work for nonprofits and environmental groups that really work on trees, and then this group that we call the Equity Council, which is really representatives from um, grassroots organizations, neighborhood organizations, and a lot of the specifically the marginalized communities where they have less canopy. And one of the things that has really emerged through that is this idea of story, tree stories, forest stories, that people connect to specific trees, specific species. They have meaning, you know, deep cultural meaning sometimes or deep personal meaning sometimes. And it's, you know, you can hear as those community advisory board members are talking, the real passion in and, and, and sorrow and loss in their voice when their tree that was in their on their street has been cut down and they don't understand why. You know, it's it's political for them, but it's also it's deeply personal. And I think that that's, you know, we've um, we see that often when we're going, we're working on a site and people will say we have a couple sites in Cambridge, you know, you have to preserve that tree. 
you know, that specific thing is really important. And I think, you know, they're, they're part of our community. You know, these trees are really part of the urban community and people mark them in different ways or, or use them as markers in different ways. And I think that that um, continues to be really interesting as we work on the forest plan and, and on, try to understand how do we build an urban forest that is um, healthy and sustainable from all the kind of data markers environmentally, but also is really meaningful to people. And one interesting thing that has going back, I think someone mentioned something about the sort of, you know, the legacy of how cities have been built and how we're dealing with that. What we see in Boston is really um, the honey locust, which was the love, great love of a lot of architects and landscape architects is the dominant species in Boston, oh, well over what is a healthy amount. You know, essentially we have a kind of history of planting monocultures in cities because of, from sort of design reasons and aesthetic reasons. But we're now, you know, we're now sort of <laughs> like coming to, uh, you know, having a different understanding or having an ecological understanding of well, how, what does that mean in the future? How do we, and I think it's an important question for us as designers, I don't think we should just follow exactly the ecological, you know, requirement, right? How do we continue to have the form and aesthetic desire that we want to bring, but do that in a way that respects and, and understands the sort of the real need for diversity and the, you know, because if we, if something comes along, we have numerous pests that are coming along and they're removing whole, whole tracks of things. So entire neighborhoods could, you know, have, a, plant, a tree gone if the right pest comes into there, you know, and is and in those kind of monocultural areas. So it's a tricky question there, I think, as we, you know, as we balance those those needs. Right. Yeah, I'm thinking about the palm trees in Los Angeles and how they've kind of outgrown their yeah. use value uh, as they get too tall. They provide no shade, um, but a whole lot of icon iconography. Well, and I had a student yeah. do some research that said a lot of those have a certain life cycle that's about to expire. And so what there is a crisis, right? It's a shade crisis, it's an urban heat island crisis. But all of a sudden, it's like, what are we doing to, to, to put in place a successional strategy to that as soon as possible, right? I, I, yeah, I think, I think we're about to sort of hit the wall there on our icons. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm going to toss it over to Anne for some final remarks. Um, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been really meaningful to me today. Thank you, Mimi. I'm going to first toss in elm trees. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin and we were ravaged by the Dutch elm disease at a, at a point in the 60s and 70s and everyone had to rethink these what were beautiful cathedral-like streets. Anyway, thank you so much all of you um, from Stas, um, both coasts and your work in between for sharing your studios and your projects with us tonight. I'd like to encourage everyone to tune in next month, sort of same time, same place, where we're actually gonna be looking at um, interspecies implications of um, installations. In fact, um, with um, Joyce Huang and Ants of the Prairie, whose work you can see if you visit the um, Exhibit Columbus site right now that Mimi was a curator for. Um, so we look forward to seeing you next month. We thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and as you can see from the loop of slides going through, we have a number of other programs, including our current work series that's starting up now too. So please visit our website, visit our programs, and thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.